you just say yes with me yes yes our beloved country jamaica is foremost in our hearts when we speak of gratitude and all this just all the amazing people we have we have given to the world and the amazing voices that bless our our nation how blessed we are to live in a vibrant democracy and how precious is our freedom of speech and association and our freedom to worship as we wish eh? Our guest speaker, as we give thanks for our beautiful island home, is none other than noted historian and author, Professor Emeritus Rupert Lewis, who I must tell you captured our imaginations and a number of the ladies' hearts last year, September, when he joined Professor Robert Hill in our celebration of Marcus Messiah Garvey. A political scientist who has published extensively on Marcus Garvey's activities in Jamaica and the Caribbean region, he has also authored research about the Caribbean activist intellectual Walter Rodney. Professor Lewis has served as member of the Council of the Institute of Jamaica and as chairman of the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica and the Jamaica Memory Bank. It, 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 the CV is too long. That just stopped right there. Um, we just call him press, uh, Prof. So <laughs> please help me welcome Professor Lewis. Thanks to God. Thanks to God. Thanks to you. And thanks to Reverend John Scott and his team for extending this invitation to me. Um, I'd like to thank you for your preparation because a service like this cannot be cannot take place without substantial amount of time spent in preparing all the different elements that go to make this up. Having grown up in a Baptist man's, I know this from first hand, you know, so this is the reason why I emphasize preparation, all the elements of it. My Thanksgiving this morning is inspired by a quotation taken by a missionary in the parish of Clarendon in a town called Mount Regal. I don't know how many people know that town in Curl. Um, in Clarendon, Regale. I may be pronouncing, mispronouncing it, but Regale, R-E-G-A-L-E. -E. And this quotation is from a freed person in 1842. I don't know how well the missionary is capturing, cap capturing the Jamaica Creole, but here we go. My dear brothers and sisters, my head quite full of joy to see you all so free and happy here today. At this hour in slave time, we all go down to the field to dig cane hole or pick coffee. And if we sick, back rough flog we for true and not hear when we cry for mercy. But now no overseer can come and drive we off to the field. Now we can work when we like and stay at home when we sick. We can buy our own land, build our own house, and go our own church. End quotation. I think that this quotation embodies the aspirations and the sense of thankfulness uh, that we have experienced as a people. But it's not sufficient to recognize this only. One has to take into account a simple fact. Fact may not, may not be so simple at all. Jamaica was a position of two European powers for 468 years, 161 under Spain and 307 under Britain. Enslaved Africans between 1511 and 1838 were subject to a total of 327 years of enslavement. So, in giving thanks, we have to take into account the historical circumstances which have determined that fact. And even during the period of slavery, there were things for which people were thankful at the same time that they struggled against the uh, subjugation, the personal brutality, the being Nothing, being not human beings, but being 
characterized as being less than human. But as was pointed out briefly in the video uh, dealing with your founder and Marcus Garvey, uh, the mind of many of the enslaved people were not enslaved. And this is why they revolted. This is why they found ways of expressing their humanity. I want to just say that religious worship and the freedom to worship, I want to take two cases of what freedom of worship means in Jamaican history. And I take these two examples from James Philippa's Jamaica Past and Present State, published in 1843. And he gives two examples. The case of an aged Negro who was punished with great severity on being asked after each successive infliction if he would promise to leave off praying and teaching, as often repeated. And this is what he said. Master may flog my flesh, but him can't flog my soul. Me must pray, Master, and me will pray, Master. Now I want us to, we take for granted the fact that you can pray and you can craft prayers and so on. But the right to pray and the hostility with which prayer was met by some of the planters, some of the overseers, is something which we don't fully appreciate. There is a case of an enslaved African, also an example from Filippo, uh, who for a similar offense in the parish of Manchester was executed and his body was suspended on a gibbet, gallery, which is a gallows, until devoured by birds of prey as a terror to others. So I just want to point out that the right to religious freedom, the right to worship, the right to pray, the reading of the scriptures is something that previous generations fought and died for. Others were more fortunate, others enslaved Africans, particularly if you were in the pen-keeping area of St. Elizabeth, Manchester, where pen-keeping conditions were different from the large-scale plantations, Clarendon, St. Thomas, and so on. And um, there's a story of the Moravian boy, Archibald Monteith, who grew up on a pen in the border lands of St. Elizabeth and Westmoreland, and whose life story has been documented by my wife, Maureen Warner Lewis, which also gives a different, a somewhat different picture of a conversion narrative, a conversion narrative which was taken down by Moravian missionaries and which documented the way in which he came to Christianity and the way in which he came to learn to read and write, and the efforts he made for manumission to get himself out of slavery by purchasing his freedom. A beautiful story of someone whose grave site still remains in the Moravian church at the, on the border of St. Elizabeth and Westmoreland. So thankfulness in these uh, stories are both harsh stories and stories less harsh, but they indicate that the process whereby we have come to be seated here in this space in July 2019, if we don't know that those stories, we won't appreciate what it means to be seated here, what it means to be worshiping here, what it means for the people of different ethnicities to have social relationships, what it means for people to be successful in business, what it means for the privilege of education, the access to education, and so on. I want to switch to the mid-20th century and to take the story from the 19th to mid-20th. My father, Reverend uh, Fergus Lewis, who died 
1962, just before independence, uh, succeeded in the Port Antonia Baptist Church, an English Baptist minister, Reverend Bastable. And there's a way in which one looks at the broader political changes that took place with independence, but you forget what happened at the level of the district, Jamaican towns, uh, what happens in villages and communities, how people were shaping new lives over time for themselves. And I am witness to what his work was, which is why I stress preparation. So one of the reasons why I didn't go into the ministry, although I went to Calabar and because of the Baptist minister's son, you boarded without paying and so on. That was a privilege. Uh, at a time when Calabar um, was a new campus on Red Hills Road, having moved from Slipe Road. And a lot of privilege was attended to being a boarder, a hundred boarders who were at school at the time. Uh, one of the reasons and why I stress preparation is that I was just amazed at the amount of preparation it took to do a service. I mean, it, 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 I saw, I saw that at three o'clock on a Sunday morning, he would be up and would not be in bed until 10 o'clock. I was going to more than one service in the morning and in the evening. And I said to myself, this thing is hard work. <laughs> this, this, this thing, I mean, most congregants come, they sit down, they listen, they are blessed, they leave, they go home. That's not how it works when you are preparing a service. It's much more complex. There's a lot that has gone into making it work. I remember, oh, amen. <laughs> amen. I remember my father engaged in building churches and nurturing communities on the eve of independence. Communities were enriched in Port Antonio, Drapers, Fellowship, Hepzibah, and Moortown. As a child, I remember the congregation giving voluntary work during the night to get the Port Antonio church building, which now is there, has been there for many years, uh, getting it completed in the same manner that so many chapels were built in the 19th century with voluntary labor of the congregation. That's a tradition that obviously has disappeared with, uh, with time. My mother, as choir mistress, organist, and teacher of music, worked alongside him. Father was married more than once, and all his wives were, had to play music. That was the... Uh, <laughs> It, it went with the relationship. My, I saw my mother go and live and open school in Moortown, in the Maroon community. And we saw her on weekends. And I live her life through the stories of the students she taught. Uh, because she died um, at age 39. Uh, when I was 10, so I really didn't get to know her as well as I would have loved to. But Vivian Crawford, executive director of the Institute, who was a child in Moortown, tells me that one evening he said to her, it's simple out there. And she called him one side and said, well, you know, you have to learn to say that it's slippery outside. So, these are little anecdotes that I recall. <laughs> it is probably not coincidental that my mother saw the potential in one Noel Dexter at Titchfield School. <laughs> when he was a small boy um, and it is through Noel that I get now a glimpse when he's speaking to me. I mean, these are just en passant comments that he's making about the mother seeing, my mother seeing his capacity, his ability, and saying that he will go far. Well, we are witness today 
to how far Noel has traveled. And the blessings that he has brought through his creativity, through his music, to all of Jamaica, people in the Caribbean, people abroad. The way in which he has been a revolutionary in creating a new hymnology for worship in, our, in all our churches. So I'm thankful for all the ancestors. Yes. I'm thankful for their lives which shaped our own. And I'm thankful for the founders of Temple of Light and for the current ministers in Church of Light, Reverend John Scott and his colleagues, and for all of you who work to make worship a blessing to all of us. Thank you very much. Wow.